Thank you. Alan, where do you go? Oh, he's coming around. The, okay. Thanks. He just mic dropped and left. Thank you all for being with us this morning. Welcome to Fairview Presbyterian Church. We have some special things going on today, and we're going to start our service with one of them. It is our annual Senior Celebration Sunday, and our graduating seniors from high school have a luncheon after this service. Uh, but I, well, I guess we could just wait until the end of the service, because y'all are still going to be here, right? Okay. Well, we're going to do it at the beginning of the service because uh, quite often when we have something we want to do, people we want to honor, we'll try to do it at the end of the first service and the beginning of the second service so that uh, there's just a concentrated amount of time that folks are, are here. Uh, but I would like to invite our seniors up. Is that okay? It's a, it's a, it's a great bunch of seniors but a fairly shy one. Um, but you're welcome to go up and say hello. You'll know them by the robes and the hats. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew would like to make a presentation to each of the seniors that he has worked with as our Director of Youth Formation and Ministry. And uh, then Terry Belger will be presenting our Robin Johnston Memorial Scholarship Award as well. So, take it away, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Well, in the first service, I gave a very short uh, encouragement, and I'm gonna give that same encouragement here because it is an encouragement uh, as much to the seniors uh, and also to you guys. Uh, so I think it's helpful for all of us to hear this. And then I have um, a senior gift to hand to everybody. And so uh, we spent the majority of this school year studying the book of Galatians. In fact, I think we spent uh, like six or seven months on a six chapter book. And so we went really into detail. And one of my favorite verses from uh, the book of Galatians is found in Galatians chapter 5. And it says, um, For you have been set free, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And Paul in this verse is primarily talking about uh, freedom from the bondage to sin. And that is true, and that is something that, that we want to proclaim over our seniors. You have been set free in Christ. But I think there's also a tangential application in that as you are graduating high school, you are going to be going forth either into college or the, the workforce or the military in, in at least one case, and uh, you will be experiencing some sort of freedom that you've not had in the past. And so I want to encourage you to enjoy that freedom, but also to use that freedom for Christ, right? To share God's love to those around you, to serve each other, to love one another, and uh, to take full advantage of the freedom that you have been given in Christ. And part of that, part of doing that is uh, reading your Bibles, and having a strong devotional life. And so we really want to encourage that. And as part of that, what we have for you as a senior gift is a journal. And on the journal, it says, be still and know that I am God. And then underneath it has your name inscribed on it. And I want to give a shout out to Robert Vogelin, who uh, inscribed the words on the front of the journal. If you guys need anything inscribed or maybe a charcuterie board goes to, or, or a plastic uh, 3D printed dinosaur maybe, then <laughs> go see Robert Vogelin and he will be able to help you with that. But then on the inside, it has um, some messages from some of your past uh, Sunday school teachers and youth directors and myself. Um, and it has some notes of encouragement there. So what I want to encourage you to do is take this journal with you and fill it up with prayers, fill it up with notes from your Bible study, because uh, when you look back at written prayers, you will very, very often find that God has answered those prayers, but maybe it's a prayer that you forgot about. And so when you fill a journal up with prayer, when you fill a journal up with Bible study, you can look back at it, and it will encourage you in ways that you wouldn't even imagine. So I'm going to, 
I want to be behind the mic still so you guys can turn around and, and I'm going to call your names individually and you can just come up here and get this. It's not as formal as a graduation ceremony, but you are in your caps and gowns, so, you know, maybe. Uh, Thomas Dunaway. Withhold your applause until the end. Yes, withhold your applause okay. until the end. <laughs> Absolutely. Juliana Guest. Brad Tilby. Lily Inter. Nick Toole. Austin Jones. There you go. And we are uh, missing Peyton Rushton today. Yes. And I, I have a journal for Peyton as well, but he is on his senior trip right now, so we're missing him. But we can remember him as well. And uh, let's give one more round of applause, please. Now you guys can go sit down and we're going to have Terry Belger come up and present the scholarship award. We already presented it in the first service, but uh, we want you guys to be able to participate in this presentation as well. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Terry Belger and I serve on the board of the Robin Johnston Memorial Scholarship. And today I have the privilege of announcing this year's recipient. This scholarship was established as an endowment by the Joe Johnston family with the first scholarship given back in 1997. The board not only looks at academic achievement, but we ask applicants to share their statement of faith, their accomplishments at school, in the community, and at Fairview. And we ask them to share their continued education and career goals, goals through both a written application and an interview process. In the interview, we asked them to share how they plan to continue their walk of faith to be a witness for Christ in the world. And also, how they plan to be a representative of Fairview as they live, leave home and begin college. Each year, we are amazed at the quality of applicants we receive. Every applicant is worthy of this scholarship. Choosing a recipient is an extremely difficult decision to make. The board carefully considers each applicant. We would like to thank all of you who submitted an application, and we know that God has great things planned for all of you. Our recipient this year of the Robin Johnston Memorial Scholarship in the amount of $2,000 is Juliana Guest. If Juliana would come forward. <clears throat> Before I hand her her check, I'd like to tell you a few reasons why she was chosen for this honor. Juliana graduated from Fox Creek High School and plans to attend the University of South Carolina and major in biomedical engineering with a goal to become a surgeon. From my understanding, she'll be able to not only design a potential implant for you, uh, she should be able to build it also, and then perform surgery, surgery to actually implant it in you. So all the while showing the love of Jesus every step of the way. Now, if that is not one-stop shopping. She's currently the principal viol violist in the Aiken Youth Orchestra her high school's yearbook editor on the senior advisory, a teacher cadet, Beta Club, National Honor Society. She has previously been on the Fox Creek cross country team, a founding member of the FBLA. She has been an active partic participant in Fairview's youth group and has been on several mission trips with the Fairview youth. She supports the family advocacy ministry, the FAM, by babysitting, providing transportation, and furnishing monthly meals. She assists with our children's church program by writing and performing puppet shows on a monthly basis and has been involved with our vacation Bible school program for six years running. You may have eaten some of her goodies as she loves to bake and has furnished numerous goodies for various Fairview groups. Even with all of this, she had time to compete in the Distinguished Young Woman of South Carolina program. This program prides itself in helping high school ladies to become confident and develop speaking skills. 
Juliana not only won the overall title of Edgefield County's Distinguished Young Woman, she won awards sort of as a subset of that for scholastics, talent, interview, self-expression, and fitness. She then represented Aiken County at the state competition, then being named South Carolina's Distinguished Young Woman. She will now travel to Alabama this summer and compete on the national level. So congratulations, Juliana. We know you will make South Carolina very proud. So we congratulate you on all that you've accomplished, and your Fairview family is very proud of you, and we know you'll spread the love of Jesus as you move on from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry, and congratulations, Juliana, and to all the <clears throat> seniors. And I'm going to steal Alan's joke from last service and say that even as a NC State and Clemson fan, uh, we can all root for a Gamecock to win in Alabama in this particular instance. Uh, so let us now go uh, to the call to worship as we prepare our hearts to join together to worship the Lord. And the call to worship today comes from Psalm 118, verses 1, 24, and 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Amen. Let us worship the Lord in song with hymn number 49. Thank you. You may be seated, and at this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss any children to Children's Church. Some of them may have gone already. I see a few, and uh, I think Miss Carolyn is out here waiting uh, for them. And uh, as they're going, we are going to prepare ourselves for the prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. And uh, it's time to come before the Lord and confess our sins. We have a written prayer of confession and then also a time of silent confession 
afterwards in which I invite you to really search your heart and um, confess anything that is on your heart so that you can receive the pardon. Pray with me. O oh Lord, you have mercy upon all. Take away from me my sins and mercifully kindle in me the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take away from me the heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh, a heart to love and adore you, a heart to delight in you, to follow and to enjoy you. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Now receive these words of comfort and assurance from the Lord. The Apostle John writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's a verse that we hear a lot, but it really is amazing news that I pray will penetrate into all of our hearts. Church, you are forgiven. Let us continue to praise God. Please be seated. Well, thank you all again for being here with us this morning. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Terry, and to all of our graduates for, for throwing on those gowns, because now you know how hot it is in one of these things sometimes in this room. Uh, so thank you all, and congratulations. I look forward to seeing you all back again on uh, hopefully a pretty regular basis, but it has been great for these past uh, five and a half years for me uh, to see you all grow up. And we're going to pray for y'all and pray for some other things as we always do. And the, uh, it is a new month, so also look in your bulletins. We have prayer focuses, foci, foci, uh, for the month in the bulletin. We've got families, missional living, and unreached people groups for this month. So always keep this handy as you're praying during your week. And uh, you can go through these guided prayers that our prayer team puts together for us and puts in each week. Our prayer team also prays for all of you on a regular basis and the staff and, uh, and uh, the, everybody involved with Fairview. Whether you know it or not, you're being prayed for on a regular basis. And uh, uh, I don't know if that makes you uncomfortable or if you, you like that. We're not going to stop. Um, so uh, hopefully that is, uh, that is an encouragement to you if you did not know it already. Let's go to God in prayer, and we'll save the Lord's Prayer for our, uh, for our uh, celebration of communion in a few minutes. Heavenly Father, it is a joy to see our children grow up to be young men and women who have heard your call through their childhood and as they've grown. We are grateful for all that they have learned and all we have learned from them. Thank you for the amazing ways you have led each of these seniors, how you have kept them close, even in the midst of the world's storms. Their freshmen and sophomore years of high school being in the midst of a pandemic with all the changes that have gone on in the world, we know that you are faithful and you are with us. Give them a great summer. And give them ambition to go into the world with your calling on their hearts. Let us be good brothers and sisters in Christ. Sticking to the vows we take in baptism that we will walk alongside them 
and walk alongside one another in discerning your will and your way. Wherever they may be going, let them know that they have a home here and that they have a home in you. And we pray for their work, their friendships, and the time ahead. And we look forward to you bringing them back from time to time with great rejoicing. Lord, let them serve as an example to us. That we can always be learning, always be growing, always be stepping into the uncertain but exciting aspects of the world that we may feel like we've grown too old for, may feel like we know too much for. Lord, let us also hear your call to be growing and learning and taking risks and being ambitious for your sake. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the joy that it is to walk alongside one another through the stages of life. Amen. Thank you, David and Ashley and Alan. Thank you, Tom, for moral support. Can't imagine somebody better to get moral support from. And thank you all again for being here this morning. We are taking a little bit of a turn in our summer series. And we've had, uh, we've had two weeks on spiritual disciplines. Initially... I was thinking we could do a spiritual discipline every week during the summer. And that way, if people are going on vacation or something and miss, it, it, each one can be its own sermon. You don't have to connect them all. And as, I was, as we were getting closer to the summer, I, I, I kind of realized I really don't want to preach on 16 consecutive spiritual disciplines. Um, or ask people to try to implement a new one every week for 16 weeks. That's just overwhelming. Uh, so we're going to do a couple at a time, and then we're going to have some more lighthearted things during the summer. So this week and next week, instead of spiritual disciplines, uh, we are going to uh, take a trip. We're going to take a trip to the beach, and later this, this summer we're going to take a trip to the lake, and then we're going to take a trip to the mountains, and we're going to take a trip, we're going to take a road trip after that. 
because all of those locations and places, places we love going, things we love doing, especially during the summer, uh, there are thematic and theological things around all of those in Scripture, and it's interesting to explore them, and it's interesting to uh, consider them as we, uh, as we travel, as we go places. We may feel like we're going somewhere to, to get away, but you know, God's there too. And maybe as we study the ways that God has used beaches and oceans and mountains and, and lakes and rivers and, and journeys in Scripture, we can grow closer to God even while we are uh, out on the road and traveling and going places. So we're doing disciplines and then we're doing summer, summer destinations, summer settings. And today is the first of those settings and it's going to be the beach the ocean. Uh, I, I picked that for today because we're going to the beach later today. And uh, I might even have some pictures next Sunday uh, for, for you to, to look at or me to brag about. Um, the, the kids, not me. <laughs> the kids. Uh, for, uh, for, for our media assistance. So we're going to go to the beach today. And um, all of a sudden, I forgot you're going to the Navy when I picked Jonah. For, for your graduation uh, Sunday sermon, but we're going to be in, in Jonah. So uh, I know that you will fare better on the seas than, uh, than Jonah did. Uh, but we have Jonah today. And one of the things to think about in getting into Jonah or anything, especially in the Old Testament, that refers to the ocean and big bodies of water is that our ancient Hebrew and Israelite ancestors did not like the water. Uh, they hated the water. They tried to stay away from it. And that's, you find anecdotes of that throughout Scripture. In the Psalms, we have verses about uh, how foreboding the waters are, uh, how the waters are, are full of mystery. There's even a line in the Psalms about the, the great sea creature Leviathan. Uh, and folks didn't want to go that close to the water. Uh, when God led them, he led them to mountains, to Jerusalem, to hills and land. And God didn't say, I'm going to send you to the promised ocean. He said, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. Even in Exodus, they, didn't, they couldn't put a foot in the water. God separated the water. And they walked on dry land in between the water. And did that in, uh, in Joshua too. And... Uh, the, the ancient Israelites just had this, uh, the, this, this thing about the open sea and the water. It was tumultuous. It was scary. Uh, they, they weren't huge fans. Nowadays, we don't quite have those fears uh, because we go to the beach often. We love getting on boats. I, I've not spent that much time out at sea. I've been on lakes and rivers and ferries and things like that. Uh, I have not spent that much time out at the sea, but I have spent a lot of time at the beach. And in general, people like going to the beach. Um, you might, if you get a beach, uh, beach trip proposed to you, you might feel like Isla does when going to the beach. Very excited, ready to jump in. Uh, if you know Isla, you know that that is how she is. Um, now, Caleb is a little bit more like the ancient Israelites. He's not too sure, not too sure about that. Um, I don't know if Jonah had that same look on his face. Uh, I'm sure he did at some points during this story that we're going to hear today. Uh, but that was more the ancient Israelite uh, attitude about the ocean and the water. Now, the water didn't start off bad in Scripture. In the very first verses of the book of Genesis, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And then God separates the waters, puts some in the sky, some on the earth, and even gives Adam the opportunity to, to name the creatures of the sea. And God gives food to the creatures of the sea. But I guess after the fall, after sin entered the world, anything that could become ominous and scary is going to become ominous and scary. Anything unknown can be a cause of fear rather than a cause of faith or hope. And so it was with our ancestors in the faith when they faced the water and the open sea. Today's passage is the whole first chapter of Jonah, verses 1 through 17. Let me pray before I read it. Heavenly Father, open our ears and hearts and minds to receive your word and seek your will. 
guide us and comfort us, even through the tumults and tempests of life. Let us take encouragement from this story that you are with us and guide us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jonah 1, 1 through 17. I have not memorized it, so just a second. Let me, there we go. Okay. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps that God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come to us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? But the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I've done a series on Jonah before here. There's only four chapters. It's a nice quick series. And uh, even if you weren't here for that, you may have heard the story of Jonah before. Uh, Jonah realizes he's in a bit of a predicament, and he prays to God, and God uh, has the fish swim to the beach, and uh, the, the fish spits Jonah out on the beach. There's some great pictures of that in children's Bibles, uh, of the, the fish just spitting Jonah out onto the, onto the sand. And then uh, Jonah decides it's probably a good idea to do what God wants, and he goes to Nineveh, and the people in Nineveh listen to him, and they repent, uh, just like the people on the ship. They, they repent and praise God, and then uh, everything's happy, right? No. Uh, Jonah gets upset because uh, Jonah had a suspicion that if he went and talked about God, then, then the people would listen, and then God would forgive them. And Jonah hated the Ninevites. Actually, uh, everybody hated the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrians were brutal. They were, they were awful. They were one of the, the, the first empires where we really hear about all of the atrocities and horrendous things they committed when conquering other people. Um, they would take, uh, if they conquered a city, they would kill all the men in front of their families, and they would take the women and children away. Uh, they would raise places to the ground. Uh, they were, it was a brutal empire. And uh, they were also um, fairly clever, too, though. They were the first... Uh, they were the first empire to have an army corps of engineers uh, so that they could ford rivers more easily and, and uh, uh, take care of mountain passes and things like that. So they could build lakes uh, 45 minutes to the north and go have picnics on July 4th, the army corps of engineers. Um, so our picnic is July 1st this year, by the way. So uh, it's a, even all of that ingenuity makes them more threatening and Jonah did not want to go there. And it turns out, 
God did forgive the Ninevites. Then Jonah got mad at God for forgiving the Ninevites. And then uh, God kind of taught Jonah a lesson and said, look, you know, there's a lot of people and animals there. Why, what's it to you if I forgive them? Why does it matter to you if I forgive them? Um, so Jonah learned a lot. And there's a lot we can learn from his story. And I'll go through. There are three things that I want to I point out here. And they're kind of obvious. Uh, but I want to delve a little bit more deeply into them. Uh, one is that you can't run from God's power. You can't run from God. You can't run from God's power. Uh, the second one is you can't uh, get around God's power. You can't run from it. You can't cut, try to, to slip your way around God's power. Uh, the third is that you, you just have to submit to God's power. Ah, it's submit. That's, that was last week's theme, the spiritual discipline of submission. And we're celebrating today, too. So we're, we're still doing some spiritual disciplines here. So you can't run from God's power. I love how frank Jonah is, the, the book of Jonah, uh, in saying God told Jonah to do such and such. And the very next thing it says is Jonah fled, ran away, immediately ran away. Uh, God wanted him to do something. He wanted no part of that. He ran away. And you can understand how he might not want to be the only person in, uh, in Nineveh trying to tell the Ninevites what to do uh, as a foreigner. Uh, but he didn't just try to run away. He went to Joppa, which is a beautiful city, kind of near present-day Tel Aviv, uh, on the beach, on the shore. It's a port. And he boarded a boat headed for Tarshish. Uh, Tarshish was at the extremity of the Mediterranean. So basically as far away as you could go. Jonah tries to run away, and it says, run away from the presence of God. And uh, that's not something you can do. I don't know if Jonah even thought he could do that. Because when they question him, he comes out and he says, uh, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So Jonah's fully aware that, uh, that God is providential over the sea, but he still tries to get away from the presence of God. Now, this would have been interesting to the people in the boat because most other nations, they didn't have just one God. They had lots of different gods. So uh, by a, a pagan person's thinking, perhaps, if the, the God on the land wants you to do something, maybe you can escape by going onto the sea because there's a different God over at the sea in these various pagan cultures. But when you have one God who's over everything, you're not gonna you're not gonna escape from it. You're not gonna get away. And if you try to get away, you're maybe in for a rough voyage, which Jonah was. Uh, he ended up in a storm on the sea. And one cool thing about the ocean and the beach is it's it's where uh, it's where so much beauty and so much power meet on the beach, because you have the waves and you see storms and, and w storms and wind. But you have your, your feet on the land, which is, which is nice, and uh, there's, it's a beautiful environment at the beach, but there's beauty and there's power, and you can, you can sense God's beauty and power. Um, and watching a storm out over the ocean, it's just it's a moving thing. It's beautiful um, from the land. Now, watching a storm on the ocean from a boat uh, is, is not as beautiful. Um, there, there's some real scary stuff going on. If the boat's going back and forth, Jonah tries to sleep through that. He tries to escape from God by going a great distance over the sea, but he's also trying to escape from God by sleeping, sleeping through God's power, sleeping through ignoring what God was trying to get him to do. But his shipmates were not having any of that. They wanted him to take account of what he was doing. And a funny thing here is that Jonah was trying to run from God because he didn't want to go to Nineveh amidst a bunch of pagans and tell them about God. But he ended up doing the exact same thing on the boat. A bunch of pagans trying to worship whatever God, call on whatever gods they have. He ends up telling them, about their God in the midst of a storm instead of in the midst of stormy people in Nineveh. You can't run from God's power. Now, we may not be trying to run from God's power by hopping on a boat to the farthest place we can think of, but 
Sometimes in life, I think we do try to run from God's power in the other way that Jonah was doing, trying to sleep through it. If we feel like God has a purpose for us or a call for us or an intention for us, it can be kind of easy to, to uh, subtly ignore that, give it a bit of a pocket veto in our lives. And I can understand why Jonah might have, uh, might have felt like he could get out of doing his duty to God. Unlike many other prophets that we find in the Bible or many other characters that we find, particularly in the Old Testament, Jonah, from all accounts, is just kind of a normal guy. He wasn't involved in, in the royal court. Uh, he wasn't a priest. He was, just, he was just a guy that God said, hey, go do this, and he didn't want to do it. So in Jonah's mind, God can probably find another guy. I'm just going to go out on the boat so God can find somebody else, and then I'll be off the hook. But God followed him. I don't think Jonah expected God to follow him, but God followed him. So we might have things in life that we would rather not deal with that God might want us to deal with. Ways in life he might be calling us to behave that, that we may not want to comply with. But at some point along the line, if we're trying to run away from God's will and God's intentions, we're going to end up in a storm. We're going to end up in difficulty. Because we can't run from who he is and who he's calling us to be. We can try to run. We can try to sleep through it. But even if we think we might try to run, he's going to pursue. And that's what he did with Jonah. He pursued, God pursued Jonah, this random guy. And that's actually kind of the good news of it. Is that even if we try to run from God, and even if we try to sleep through the storms of life and ignore them and ignore what might be going on in the world that's difficult, uh, God's still going to pursue us. And he's still going to try to right our ship or throw us overboard. But even then, he'll take care of us. So there's running away from God. You can't run away from God, A, because God is everywhere, and you can't run from him. But you also can't run from him because he's willing to pursue you. There are a lot of parallels in Jonah and in what God reveals to us in the person and work and Savior of Jesus. That he's willing to go even to the greatest depths to pursue us that he's willing to go as far as possible to save us and doesn't mind saving other people in the process. So the fact that we can't run from God is actually good news. It might sound scary in the storms of life and when we know that we may have gone astray, but not being able to run from God is really good news because we know that he's willing to pursue no matter how far we might go. You also can't just get around God's power. Can't cross over God's power. Jonah knew that God was God of the water and the sea as well, that he had created it. When you try to cross over God's power, you're also in for a rough voyage. Jonah essentially tries to test the reach of God's power and finds out that God's power reaches pretty far. But even in trying to get around what God wanted him to do, God put Jonah, or Jonah ended up in a position of doing exactly what God was telling him to do. He got on a ship with a bunch of pagans and ended up witnessing to them and ended up being that one voice on the ship who could invite God to calm, calm the storm, which he did. And then we find that these other people on the ship, they started praising God and even offered a sacrifice to God. God's going to find a way to put you in a position that he wants you in. And that might be uncomfortable. It might be difficult. We might want to run from it. We might want to sleep through it. But once we realize what God is wanting to do and that we can't run from him, we find that, yes, he is indeed with us, and 
he's giving us the right things to do and words to say and perspective to have. Jonah was maybe trying to test God a little bit by running away and seeing if God would follow. But God was also testing Jonah here because he was preparing Jonah through this storm, through this uncertainty and difficulty for the very thing he was ultimately calling him to do anyway. When we, we may be in a storm in life, it may be something of our own making, maybe something going on around us, but we can't forget that God can use that storm to prepare us for his will. But it helps to acknowledge him in the storm, to rely on him in the storm, to recognize in the midst of the storm that he's the only one that can guide us safely. Jesus is the only one who can guide us through in the storms of life. So you can't run from God's power. You can't try to get around God's power. There's a, what's that? There's a, there's a song that uh, the kids, my kids, and you can't, uh, going on a bear hunt? You can't, you gotta go, you can't go around it. You can't go over it. You gotta go through it. You gotta submit to God's power. And as we see with Jonah, you gotta submit to God's power for your own sake and for the sake of those around you. Because by submitting to God and acknowledging who he is, Jonah ends up leading all these other people on the ship to a knowledge and understanding of God and his grace. By going and talking to the Ninevites, Jonah ends up displaying God's grace. And it was scary in both cases. One son of Jonah was terribly thrilled about doing in either case. But God cared for him through it and got him through it in both cases. So we submit to God's power, not just for our own sake, to, to, to stop God from hassling us and just comply with what he wants. We do it for the sake of people around us because when we are uh, following him, when we are living out our call, when we are true to who Jesus wants us to be, it may create some storms and difficulty with other people sometimes. But ultimately... If we're aligned with God's purpose, that's better for everybody around us. And as we see at the start of the next chapter, or well, actually I think it's the end of the next chapter, God can bring us back. Bring us back from the sea. Bring us back from the storm. He may not do so on the path that we would have chosen, like a, the middle of a fish, a fish's belly, but he does. And when the fish spits Jonah out on shore, uh, he ends up following through with the very same purpose that God had given him in the first place. His point A and point B are still the same. He decided to go through that storm and learn a few things in the process, but he still has the point A, Jonah, I'm telling you to do this, and the point B, go to Nineveh. So God will still return us from the storms of life with his purpose and his direction. One thing I like about, I kind of took a detour from the beach there for a few minutes, but uh, one thing I like about that, uh, that tension between power and beauty on the beach uh, is exactly what happens on the shore when things wash up. Uh, sometimes you'd be pretty surprised what washes up on shore. And Jonah found himself washed ashore as well. But the waves out in the ocean that the Israelites, the ancient Hebrews were so afraid of, that we see as being so powerful, the waves that maybe 50, 100 yards out uh, can sweep you off of your feet and carry you out to sea, can knock you over. Uh, eventually, once they get right into shore, they're just a tiny trickle, just a gentle, soft wave, a little bit of foam. But it's the same wave, right? Right? A wave way out there is powerful. Wave right here at shore is same wave, but is gentle. Gentle and graceful. Sometimes God's power is most present even when it's least noticeable. So when I say we need to submit to God's power, 
we may think of things like just stand aside and let God do something amazing, let God work a miracle. When we think of God's power, we may think of the impressive things like storms or mountains or big crashing waves. But God's power also comes, maybe even more often comes, in the more subtle things, the more gentle tendencies. After all, the sands of the seashore, it's thousands, millions of years of the gentle rocking of the ocean and the crashing of those smaller waves, rolling them up to go from stone and shells to little grains of soft sand. When God was promising to Abram that he would make a nation out of Abram, he said, your descendants will be like the sands of the seashore. And I'm sure Abram thought, oh, great, I'm going to have lots of descendants. Um, I'm, he probably didn't think, oh, God's going to pound us into submission until we're softened so that we can actually do as well. But both happen. But God's power often happens in subtle, constant, continuous ways. The gentle pushing along through the day that he's able to give us. The long obedience in the same direction that he calls us to have. We think of the big, impressive things as demonstrations of God's power. But demonstrations of God's power can be just the routine, regular prayer, study, worship, fellowship that he calls us to in life. And when he calls us to go to Nineveh and preach to the Ninevites, sure, we can have the confidence to do that. When he calls us into a storm in the world, we can have the confidence to do that. If we've been attuned to his power moving us along regularly. Because he can give us a really big push if he wants to. But over the course of days and years and months, he can push us a lot farther with his gracious and gentle hand. And even when we feel like we are in the belly of the beast in the midst of the ocean, like Jonah was, even when we may not feel that push, we might simply be carried by God in his protection. So Jonah was in the belly of a fish. There's more significance to that uh, than we just get from reading the story. Because I'm going to show you a picture of Nineveh's god. That is Dagon, Triton, Dagon, King Triton. His daughter was Ariel. Um, also, Little Mermaid? No, okay. First service knows there's a Little Mermaid out. Anyway, the fish god. The Ninevites worshipped the fish god. God had called Jonah into the midst of the city that worshiped the fish god. And then as Jonah's running away, he sends Jonah, in, he sends a fish to swallow Jonah. He says, I'm going to be with you even in the midst of this fish and this weird god who doesn't exist and his city that worships him. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to carry you to safety even in the midst of this. Because I'm the one in control. And then even when Jonah got upset that God didn't smite all the Ninevites, God reminded him, I'm in control. What is it to you? What is it to you that we say that I save these people in this city? Jonah didn't want to see the beauty in the grace, the beauty in God's gentle hand, the beauty in God's restraint. But that's often where we see his power as well. God gave Jonah protection in his presence, even in the worst. God can make great waves happen in the world. But his power is often best seen through his gentle guidance, our gentle compliance, and his grace. Because that's where the story of Jonah ends, and it actually ends on a cliffhanger. Did Jonah accept that or not? Do we only want to see God do the biggest things? Or do we submit to God's power even in the small things? Because we often try to run from the small things too. But 
If we want to feel his power, that's the best place to start and the longest route that he can lead us on. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Jonah, for his power, for your faithfulness to your word and your call. And we ask that you can move us into the storms of the world with faith and confidence, knowing that you can carry us, guide us, and protect us. We want to see your power in great things. We ask that you can help us see your power and beauty in small things as well. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. On the night of his arrest, shortly before he went into the belly of the earth for three days, Jesus was having dinner with his friends, his disciples. During dinner, he held up a loaf and blessed it and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Scripture instructs us to examine ourselves as we prepare to take these elements, lest we invite judgment on ourselves. We have confessed our sins in the midst of one another. We have been assured of God's grace. We have heard his word. Now we come to the table. Let us pray. O God, who by Jesus' blood and body, his death and resurrection, has provided us a new and living way into the relationship that you desire to have with us, Cleanse our minds and hearts by the work of the Holy Spirit, so that as we come forth, we may do so with a pure heart and undefiled conscience, that we may receive these gifts untainted by sin, and go forth shining your light and proclaiming your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We continue our prayer as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All who proclaim faith in Jesus may come forward and receive the elements. And I'll invite our elders up to facilitate that. And if we need to come and bring uh, some bread or juice to you in the pew, uh, then we'll be sure to, to notice that. Is the body and blood of Christ broken and poured out for you. You may come forward as you feel ready.
Friends, having taken these elements together, let us stand and join in saying what we believe using the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin and also appearing on the screens. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I also want to thank those who prepare communion, who come in on uh, Friday or Saturday and make sure everything is ready. Uh, I'm especially grateful for them after the last service in which I dumped pretty much the entire, uh, entirety of one of the baskets onto the floor uh, and uh, was glad that there was enough there. Um, but it, don't worry, five-second rule, so y'all who ate those, you're fine. Um, we got them right back in there pretty quickly. Uh, no, y'all did not eat uh, floor bread. So don't worry about that. Uh, as you go, uh, go with the encouragement that God loves you enough to pursue you. He's shown us that in Christ Jesus. As Andrew mentioned in our assurance of pardon earlier, he loves you enough to pursue you. He loves you enough to give you a call. He loves the world enough to give you a call to serve him. So go out from here submitting to his power in the great things and even the small things, knowing how far he can lead. As you go, may the hands of Christ tend your wounds. May the Holy Spirit bring to your minds just the things that you need to hear. May you dwell in the Father's arms at the last. Amen. <laughs>